Hi everyone, welcome to the 18th episode of Conceptualism. Very pleased today to have with me an artist who is crossing boundaries uh, and documenting uh, some of the skills and ideas uh, that our forefathers have, have contributed to uh, human culture. Um, I'm, I'm very happy, uh, you know, to have you here with us, um, uh, Kili, and uh, thank you, thank you for agreeing to do this. Oh yeah, it's nice to be on here. Oh, yeah, much appreciated. So I want to start by by asking you about um, about your cultural heritage and and you know I was listening to some of your your talks earlier and and you talk about the stories that your grandmother used to tell you. Um, so I wanted to know about that tradition of storytelling and like how it how it's affected your your worldview. Uh, well, yes. Yeah, so um, both uh, Chinese and the Nai Kletzka, which is um, Siberian native, um, and and also American, of course. <laughs> Uh, we've mostly been raised here. Uh, and um, yeah, <clears throat> storytelling is really important to us, um, especially to the Nai, but also important to Chinese people as well. It's, you know, it's a long tradition um, in both of those cultures. And I think um, what's interesting about uh, the Nai culture in particular is that we have a really powerful oral, oral storytelling culture. Uh, and, and in fact, we actually have this kind of epic storytelling um, moments when um, some of the epic stories are actually told over a space of a week, you know, so it's a cultural thing where everyone gets together um, and listens to someone unfolds this epic story that takes place over the period of a week. They, and um, there are like these long murals that go along with it too, um, that will span the entire inside of the building to illustrate a story um, like that. But, you know, I wasn't really part of the, that, the, the epic storytelling tradition because I we were separated from my culture. Um, or for our cultural homeland, uh, for any variety of reasons, <laughs> um, war and communism and uh, stuff like that. So essentially, um, uh, the, my connections through story to my culture is through my grandmother telling me stories and through my mother as well. Uh, my mom also, um, although she's mostly uh, told me Chinese stories. So we have kind of uh, um, like a, a large variety of different stories uh, from within those cultures. And I'm also, also very, very interested in um, other kinds of stories too, um, stories of spider woman and Dene and, um, and uh, Norse culture uh, too. I just find stories of that kind of form. Uh, a lot of the ancient stories, especially ones that come from an animistic tradition to be super interesting. And so, um how how does this um uh you know this idea of of you know narrative and and you know these beautiful murals that you're describing um how does that then become photography and filmmaking uh you know because that's your 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 i guess your primary practice is photography um how how do these ideas then translate into your photograph like like you know the idea of telling a story but then also the mechanics of it like you know actually capturing what's happening or documenting sort of the the how or the what or the why of the of you know the scene that you're capturing well as a visual journalist um you know uh, stories are the currency of visual journalism for sure uh, you know like regardless of the medium mm -hmm. the, the story itself is incredibly important and you know uh, at National Geographic, we, we always say that we are journalists before we are photographers or before we are writers. You know, that's we have to be um, we have to be uh, storytellers of the the first order, <laughs> um, and that's really important. Figuring out what the story, what a story is, um, and what it isn't. Um, a lot of telling a story is figuring out what a story is not, so that we don't um, overload people with a ton of information that isn't necessary. Yeah. Uh, you know, but also, um, I've just, just long been a very visual person. Uh, so I, I went to school for design, uh, actually three-dimensional design, industrial design, um, and worked as a graphic designer. So uh, like having visual design stuff has long been really important to me. Uh, and so going into photography, I actually didn't go into photography until I was in my mid-30s uh, or early 30s. Um, so, and I picked up a camera and very shortly thereafter, uh, just, uh, got into the career of being a photographer. Um, so it's been kind of a quick ride, <laughs> I guess, uh, in a lot of ways. 
Um, but but in another way, it, it also has it. It's, sort of, it's like the medium itself, the technical part of it is not that difficult to learn. I mean, it is, it's a challenge to learn, but it's not the most important part. The most important, the most difficult part of the, being a storyteller um, is, or being a visual journalist is learning the journalism part and the storytelling part. Um, and um, I suppose learning the visual principles of what makes good composition, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So when it comes down to it, learning the technical parts of um, using a camera um, and all of that is, uh, is um, in some ways the smallest piece of that, that whole thing. Right. But I mean, like, I'm sure it also matters to you, like, what, what camera you're using or what lenses you're using, like, you know, the choices that you make, you know, in that, like, um, I was just listening to where you were talking about, you, you were documenting, um, I'm forgetting her name, but this woman who leads these expeditions or adventures and where everybody has to live in the stone age. So mm -hmm. like you, you said, like you were explaining like the compromise of like, you know, you could bring your a camera and a couple of lenses, but you weren't able to bring like your your bag. You had to use like a you know a, a skin or a, a hide bag to you know store your mm -hmm. equipment in. Um, so I thought that was really interesting because you must have had to think to yourself, okay, what gear am I going to take? And like you had to like make a choice, like this is what I'm going to take because this is what I'm trying to capture. Yeah, definitely. The, the, the technical considerations are very significant. Um, you know, I'm, there's one level of it where there's a, there's, you know, you can kind of, uh, most professional photographers, for the most part, you can probably go to them and say, all right, here is a camera and a lens, and mm -hmm. um, you need to make this work. <laughs> and we will find a way to make it work. We will, you know, um, so in that sense, uh, it's um, the equipment isn't that important, but in another sense, it is also very important because we, the specific equipment we choose to work with defines what we can and can't do, especially those, you know, um, especially the kind of photographer that I am uh, working at the National Geographic, there is, uh, we tend to be uh, boundary pushers for what is technically possible. Right. I have a lot of the stuff that people really love, underwater photography, uh, working in extreme regions, uh, like for me, the Arctic, and the, the particular equipment is important, um, but that's not to say that there's not a lot of other equipment that can do the same job and so the most important part of it is to figure out what it is that you need and then learn it really well right to, to you know it's a bit like um i guess in a lot of ways it is can be compared to playing an instrument you know like the choice your choice of instrument matters a lot but everyone knows that it's not your choice of guitar that makes a good guitarist yeah. um, um, right, so um, Eric Clapton can make, uh, you know, a, a cardboard box with a string on it sound much better than, <laughs> than me on a, on a regular guitar. Um, so the, the, there's a really huge difference uh, there, I would say. You know, we, we, a lot of these, these kinds of technical things, too, we figure out through practice, yes. right? So, um, you yeah, know, like, especially for me working in uh, the far north, I, I cut my teeth on working in subarctic regions, like, uh, not just subarctic regions, but subarctic regions in, um, in, in wildlands, you know, places that are far away from infrastructure, yes. um, it, um, and camping overnight and just being in nature um, all the time. It, I learned that in uh, what I consider to be Arctic light, which is Iceland. You know, Iceland is a far northern country, but it's not really that cold. Um, and there's a lot of infrastructure all around. You know, if you need to, pretty much anywhere in Iceland, you can drive half a day and, and get yourself a hamburger <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, uh, yes, it sounds like a lot to drive half a day to get a hamburger. Uh, but compared to most places in the Arctic, that is not an option. There's no such thing. There are not even roads to most of those places. Uh, and some, there are some places where I've been left where the plane will come back in three weeks at a certain date if the weather's right. And if not, uh, good luck. <laughs> 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 so um, practice is really important. And figuring out what kinds of equipment you have, not just the camera gear, but I mean, like, you know, what parkas are you going to be wearing? What kind of boots? How are you going to dry out your boot liners to keep them from freezing? It's, you know, you can wear um, most snow boots for a single day and it's no problem. But after a week, the perspiration from your feet goes into the socks, goes into the boots, and that freezes. And that's when your feet really get cold. That's when you lose toes and that kind of thing. So um, it's incredibly important um, to know that you need boots with removable liners that can be dried out over a fire or dried out in a shelter. Um, yes. But it's not something that you really learn from uh, people 
it's very difficult to learn this um, unless you're learning it from someone else who does um, that exact thing, which is to spend weeks and months out on the land without going back to the home base or something happens. Right? You need to learn those kinds. And then you have to figure out what works for you particularly. Um, some things may not be relevant. Uh, a lot of people in the North are really tough and very resilient and willing to put up with things that I'm not willing to put up with. <laughs> so, um, and they have different ways of doing things. They'd be willing to cart in like a propane, um, a tank of propane um, to last a week and switch it out or something like that. Whereas I wouldn't be willing to. Uh, instead, I will, uh, I'll, I'll bring a really high tech sleeping bag that's very thick and manage that way. So there's just different kinds of ways that we have to to do things, but there's only one way to learn a lot of this stuff, um, which is practice, trying it out, practicing right. it in places where the stakes aren't so high. <laughs> so it's, like, it's, it's yeah. not book knowledge, it's received wisdom and wisdom that comes from experience. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's a little bit of all of that. But I would say in a lot of ways, you know, um, you can, nowadays in the age of the internet, you can learn the vast majority of things. Uh, so someone on YouTube has probably done it before and has explained it to you and there's probably 13 information somewhere, right? So <laughs> <laughs> probably figured uh, <laughs> out how to do it. And you can learn most of those things, but in a lot of ways, I would still say that the, some of the most important skills that um, exist in the world can't be found on the internet. You, especially as a creator, as a creative, when you're trying to, um, when you're trying to do something that is new and original or trying to um, look at things from a new perspective, there's often things that you will have to do that people have not really tread on very much. Um, there isn't a lot of information out there. The stuff that's hardest to get, hardest to figure out is the, in a lot of ways, the stuff that's the most valuable knowledge to have um, because it's not easy to learn, because there's no resources for it. Um, and that that is what distinguishes um, the, the, people who are working at the very high end of things and uh, those who are not. <laughs> and, you know, there's this idea that you discussed, which is, um, you know, which I think is really beautiful, which is the idea of permission and how an indigenous culture, like, um, you know, receiving like permission to, to take a photograph or, or, you know, or somebody sharing a, a piece of knowledge with you and then you become the keeper of that knowledge or you're, you know, you, you sort of become entrusted with that knowledge. So, um, like, yeah, there, there's all these, like, I guess, intangible aspects to taking a photograph, which most people don't think about when they see a photograph. But, like, you probably have had to spend time with that person or with that culture or with that tradition for, I don't know, maybe a month or three months or six months before you're able to actually capture that one photo, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I, I would say that it doesn't, uh, it's not a, it's not as long as, um, you know, I'm not, not spending more months at a time uh, trying to build trust. Uh, it, uh, I think that in certain situations, you can, if you're going to create a very particular project, you can put that kind of investment of time in. But usually we're talking about weeks of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, weeks of time, it is, uh, you're totally right. There's different, uh, Frazi, still there? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. Got your video for that for a second. Um, yeah, uh, there's sometimes there's, um, you know, there, it's really easy to tell people stories in, in a certain way where you can just go in the way that um, colonial storytellers have gone in for a long time, which is to go in and just basically essentially steal someone's story. You know, you go in, take some pictures, you talk to a couple of people, and, and then you disappear. Um, and then that that becomes how the world thinks of the particular place, especially if it's not a place that has, a, is, has been deeply connected to the mainstream uh, media or mainstream world. Yes. Uh, but you know, the, the, the problem is, is a lot of them is really surface and when you bring your biases, because we all do, we all bring biases with us. Those biases get to be really powerful when you don't have a lot of things to replace them. You don't have a lot of reality to replace those biases. So you, you'll tend to see the, the world as the way that, um, you know, if you're a hammer, you see everything as a nail, <laughs> um, right? And, uh, and so the longer that you spend around a place, the more that your preconceived notions are, are dropped. Um, and the um, people, the other thing is that people will let you into their lives a lot more, um, especially if you're actually useful. You know, um, instead of, uh, you know, I would say most cultures in the world, non-Western cultures especially, don't really appreciate it when you really just kind of stand around like a wallflower and, and um, they wonder why on earth you're there. Like, why, what are you doing here? 
hanging out with us for days at a time, just standing there, not talking to anyone, not doing anything, you know, which is what journalism has been for a long time, this idea that you're going to be on a fly on the wall. Right. Really, most cultures of the world um, tend to welcome people who are going to participate, participate and be a part of it um, for you to ask permission that once you've gotten permission to actually be part of the place and the land and the culture and the community, to yeah. be a part of the family, and to actually you know, do stuff, go and gather wood, um, if need be, uh, play with the kids, um, drive people places, um, sometimes do stuff like uh, help to gut an animal or whatever it is, you know, so various different things. And whatever it is that, you know, like as a person, the more experience you have of, as being, um, of being, a person in different situations, the more useful you are and the more helpful you are. And then people start to let you into the world because you realize that you're, um, you're not just kind of like, a, it, they, they understand you more. They're like, oh, you're a human being. You're here, you're just a visitor. Um, and we'll treat you like a guest. Um, and eventually after a while, you're no longer just a guest, you're a part of that community. That's really important. And you know, nature is the same way. Even if you're approaching wildlife, it's the same kind of idea. When you, if you are to just walk up on an animal suddenly and quickly, there's no way you're gonna get a photograph of it, right? You haven't been invited. You haven't been uh, uh, allowed into the space. Whereas if you spend, um, you spend a couple of days sitting inside of a blind watching an animal, or if you, even if you're not in the blind, if you spend a couple of days around um, a place, weeks around a place, and you get to know the terrain and the, the species and that particular individual animals, they start to recognize that you're around and eventually they have to go about their own business. They have to go about life, you know, and they accept that you're there and then you're not a danger to them um, if you're putting out the right vibe, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you, you get invited into their worlds and that is when good photographs start to become made, you know, when stories you can tell are actually real. Um, and as it was not only, you know, the authenticity of stories, it's kind of like, it's very easy to it's really easy at first to just kind of be like, oh, um, I can make stuff up or I can have uh, my biases can still tell, with my biases, I can still tell a good story. Yeah. But the world is changing. No longer is it like there's just one voice coming from a particular place and well, you can't control that narrative anymore. People recognize when things are authentic when they're not anymore. Uh, so uh, the deeper that you can go, the, the uh, more currency you have as a storyteller. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, and, you know, I'm also, like, I'm also thinking, you know, in terms of like this idea of, you know, uh, being useful and participating in the culture, like, you know, as, as a musician, you know, when I've gone to different places to study with, you know, a certain master of that tradition, then, you know, it's like, you know, you learn just as much by living with them and participating in the things that are, you know, quote unquote mundane, like, you know, like eating food together or going for a walk together. You learn just as much from doing that as by actually like watching them do what they do or them actually telling you, this is what, you know, this is what I do or showing you, this is what I do. So I, I think, I think this idea of living life and, and like being an active participant rather than a passive, passive observer is so important because the best way to learn is to participate, at least yes. for me. And, and I think for a lot of people, because by participating, you're engaging all your senses and all the different learning styles are catered for, whether you're a visual learner, an oral learner, kinesthetic, whatever, you're able to actually like learn in, in like this really beautiful way. So it totally makes sense to me. Yeah, absolutely. You're totally right. You're, you're uh, living in the world with all your senses um, and able to pull in additional information that can inform, you know, as a, people think that as a photographer, that, um, that things other than visual things are not important to you sometimes, you know, but um, that's not really true. Like uh, your entire experience informs what kinds of things you're going to be interested in, like who you're going to visit next, where you're going to walk. Um, the information that you find out about something dictates what you're going to be interested in and um, thus where you're going to put your camera, right, um, over time. And so that makes a huge difference, it makes an enormous difference. Uh, I would say that cross-pollination across mediums is incredibly important. You need to, um, you need to be, like a lot of, um, a, a lot of photographic artists I know of are inspired by other mediums, They're inspired by music, um, inspired by writing. Writing is a particularly potent, good one. 
for journalists, uh, especially, yeah. but you know, there's all these other mediums in which you can get inspired by stuff. Totally. And, and I mean, mm. one of the reasons I started this podcast is because I wanted to capture people that were interdisciplinary and people that were sort of, you know, interested in the process of, of, of making things rather than just, you know, the, the product or the result. Because like, uh, like in Western culture, things are measured by the result uh, th that, that is produced, whereas in non-Western cultures, it's much more about the process and the actual, you know, what went into making whatever it is, you know, and sort of the value of something is sort of determined not so much by the product that, that comes out, but actually the time and effort and initiative and blood, sweat and tears that actually went into making what it is you made, you know. So like yeah. it's a it's a different it's a different process and also the idea of value like what makes something valuable you know um, it's so different when 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 you're learning about indigenous cultures and lear learning about you know non Western cultures. Yeah, and you know, but I mean, re realistically, every culture is weird. I mean, one indigenous culture will be totally different in the kinds of there's there's real trends in the kinds of things that indigenous cultures value, hmm. uh, but you know. Um, the, there could be really major differences between them as well. So Definitely. Uh, it's one of the great fascinating things about human culture is uh, how, how different the world really is when you're able to see from a, from, a, from a different cultural perspective. It's mind blowing sometimes. It is, and it's unfortunate that people lump all the different indigenous cultures together. The same thing happens for African cultures or Indian cultures. You know, people will ask you, do you speak Indian? And it's like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right yeah, it really takes away from the richness of what's going on yeah uh, yeah <laughs> right but uh, yeah it's just amazing to me like think about I mean, you think about for americans how much um how much uh play is had between uh just different accents of american english yeah you know people making fun of each other or um you know but doing accents from different regions of just the United States in American English, not even British English, right? And so, um, and that's that's all the same language within the same language family. There are places um, around the world where, in, within a single country, you have hundreds of different languages that come from totally different language families, uh, which people cannot understand each other. And there's just so there's so much richness there. It's totally like mind blowing. Um, yeah. It's very interesting to see the difference between places that haven't um, that have been less colonized and places that have been more colonized. Places that have been colonized more tend to be um, tend to be more um, the same. Tend to be more monocultural. <laughs> well, and and it's interesting too, like uh, because of colonialism and because of you know um, sort of the Western influence on things. You know, people have tried to sort of conform. With, with, you know, standards that are not their own or, or you know, their cultures have been erased. Like, for example, you know, um, in Canada, you had the residential schools, which would, which would strip away the indigenous culture, um, you know, whether it was your name or your, you know, your spirituality, they, they, you know, it would be forced to, to conform to Christian, you know, ideals or Christian norms. And that to me is, is one of the most fucked up things that, that, that the world has ever produced, you know, in terms of like trying to appropriate or erase someone else's culture. Like that respect for for other the otherness or or I would say the the differences like I think honoring those differences is like really the difference between something that's a homogenous culture and something that's truly a pluralistic culture you know and something that allows people to be who they are without telling them okay you know what like if you don't fit in with us and you don't fit, like that whole us and them thing you know um, yes I think as you you hit upon a really important point which is um, I think that it's it's interesting. Right, because in um, like a lot of the dominant, uh, uh, I guess you could say, social institutions, like certain particular religions, which are very aggressive um, and very missionary, have come to dominate the world. Um, and uh, you know, lots of cultural things, you know, uh, um, like the Western cultures, have come to dominate a lot of the a lot of the world's cultural. Um, Space. mentalities like individualism for example yes. um has, has, you know spread far and wide and uh, what's interesting i think about it in a lot of ways though is that um you know well, over time what you start to see is uh, that even though these um these places these kinds of institutions are very successful as part of it, and part of it is their aggressiveness um another thing that i would see over time is that over time uh 
diversity becomes more, as the world becomes more homogenous, um, that kind of things that stand out and, and are different, if you've managed to hold on to them, are become more and more valuable. So yes. um, it's kind of a, a fascinating, uh, weird thing, which is to say that it, it, in um, the, the things like um, Christianity, ultimately, I don't know about Christianity, but it would say like individualism eventually suffers from the result of its own success. <laughs> um, in that uh, everyone is different, but you know, but in, your, in the same way. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting thing uh, to look around and to, to recognize that uh, there's these very particular trends that are happening in the world. Um, and oftentimes, when you don't play in that or you don't accept it, you become mar marginalized. But if you look at it the right way, you can use those things to your advantage. Yes. You know, you're gonna have to put up with the, the disadvantages, which are great, many, but um, sometimes being marginalized gives you additional perspectives and ideas uh, and influences that you wouldn't get from the other place. And those become incredibly valuable in a world that um, where stories and information are the most important thing. Yes. And, and, you know, um, I was also thinking like, you know, when you brought up biases and, you know, and so, uh, I, I was kind of thinking about, you know, the criteria that we use to judge things like, you know, um, you know, when, when, when you want to decide, okay, is this a good photograph? You know, that, like you said, at, when you work at National Geographic, there's these criteria or these standards that you apply to, you know, to taking, uh, you know, a, a photograph or writing a story. And so, I guess my question is like, what are your personal criteria? Like not, not the ones that, that National Geographic tells you or not the ones that are sort of, you know, told to you by the photography community or by the artistic community, but like your own personal standards. Like, what are you looking for? Like when you take a photograph, like what inspires you? You know, what are you like, what are you looking for, I guess? Well, I think with all art and any kind of art really um, in a lot of ways, we, we don't have any choice except to be, um, <laughs> Except be moved by the thing that we're moved by you know it's it's very personal and so yes and our, i mean you, i don't know I, I guess it's possible to be a very commercial artist yes um and to make things that other people want only but i would say for the most part people really get it and they understand that that art is um you're, you're moved by what you're moved by that's just part of what it means to be a human being <laughs> you know long ago you can't be uh, by definition you can't be moved by something that doesn't move you <laughs> uh, but I mean, I, I'd say that most art, uh, you are inspired by something because it moves you. And uh, later, we'll, as a photographer, especially, we look back at all the moments in time that we've captured that have moved us. And then we think about um, whether those things continue to move us and now that we've looked at it on the, you know, on the computer, in the dark room, whatever. Um, and then uh, we think about whether they move other people as well. You know, and chances are, if they've moved us deeply, then they'll move other people. And that it is the number one criteria. Does it move me? Does it make me feel? It doesn't have to be a positive feeling. You know, uh, there are many photographs that I really love that are eerie, uh, yeah. that are eerie, that are creepy, that are spooky, that are maybe a little repulsive sometimes. You know, um, I have a photograph of a, of a young uh, falcon uh, fledgling it's, uh, whose legs are just covered in mosquitoes. And you feel, you just look at the winds, you know, just like, oh God, ugh, you know? But it, what makes that thing a good photograph, um, it, it gives it some excellence is because it makes you feel, it makes you feel for those, you, you know, you um, can empathize with that, that baby falcon uh, and that moves you. And that's really what it's all about. You know, photographs have that particular capacity. There are some art mediums, there are some other mediums of which being moved is not the primary Thing. You know, I would say like nonfiction writing, for example, mm -hmm. where um, it's a little bit less important. Um, ideas are, are perhaps just as important, but for the most part, anything in the fine arts um, is mostly about be making people feel something. Yes. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Um, and do you, do you like document or catalog or write about your work? Like, do you like, um, uh, do you have like a, a process of sort of I don't know, analyzing or maybe intellectualizing the, the work that you do? Well, we're, well, I'm always thinking about the work that I do. You know, like, yeah. um, in the process of creating a story or uh, doing a story, you're always thinking about it because if you don't think, the more you understand the story, the better the photographs are going to be. 
yes. 100%. And um, I think about them a lot. And then I also, you know, I have to caption uh, images as well. So I'm taking notes. Um, right. And I'm always talking about the story with other people. You know, always talking about, you know, any chance I get to discuss something like that, I'm always discussing it because it informs what I know, um, right. which helps me in the job itself. Okay, so that's always a really big part of it. And, you know, I not only do I write captions for, for my editors, but um, I also eventually, after the story has been published, I'll release my own edit, my own version of the story, which is just a photo essay with captions attached. So the entire story is told through the captions and pictures together. So, right. um, so it's really important to me to understand the story as best I can. And you can kind of tell, too. There's some stories where I don't work on it for as much time, and in the captions, you can see that, um, you know, it's not quite as coherent. It doesn't have the, it's not as strong, it's not as powerful, um, because I just don't understand it quite as well. It's just, uh, there's, there's gaps. But the more that you do, uh, the more experience you have on understanding something in a particular field, the, the, the more that will translate across um, to other things that you work on, you know, um, and uh, the more experience in general that I have where I understand how stories work and um, sort of the basic, basic tenets of uh, humanity, mm. <laughs> the, better, the better I understand every story that comes my way. And how important are titles or, or leaving something untitled? Titles, you mean titles in photographs? Of photographs? Sure, yeah, or, or like, or of a photo essay or like, whatever, like, like, or an exhibition, like if you're doing a, I don't know, like an exhibition, like the title of it, like how it, I actually, I couldn't say, I couldn't tell you whether, how important they are really. Um, I think that there's probably some, there's some level um, of writing a good title, which is uh, somewhat important for something like an exhibition because the title, a lot of times people um, decide where to go to an exhibition based on how intriguing the title is, you know, for a fine art exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, and we know, that titles are important <laughs> for news articles because uh, that's the whole point of clickbait. You write a very particularly <laughs> intriguing uh, title that is designed to lure you in, you'll get more people to click on it, right? So, yes. so that's definitely a thing. Um, but you know, I did just don't, I kind of sort of feel like it's not really a thing for um, for us us to obsess about. You know, if you are a copywriter and that's your area to obsess about, then good. <laughs> But um, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a photographer, so uh, I, I, there's no need for me to, to get too involved in that. Ultimately, the, the most important thing by far is the actual work that I do with photography. Yes. Yeah. That's Which is not to say, though, that being able to talk about and being able to, uh, yeah, being able to talk about the work isn't extremely important. In some ways, it's um, just as important as your technical skill, your photography skill, is being able yeah. to talk about the work that you do. Um, but that doesn't, I doesn't necessarily mean that um, you need that in a title per se. And do you, do you ever work um, in black and white with, uh, you know, with black and white uh, photography? You know, I, I used to, I did some black and white um, early on, but I don't do very much black and white at all, really. Um, yeah, I don't know. In the, the door is always open for that, but I, I very much see and think in color uh, and as, yeah, as, as a way of seeing the world and, and part of that. Um, I think part of that also happens to be because the work, the color work that I do is already very close to black and white to a large degree. A lot of the stuff that I photograph is already fairly monochromatic, so yeah. it's in that far to black and white. So it's not that different per se. I kind of, I kind of noticed that. That's why I brought up this question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that's the, and, and that's not necessarily due to, um, well, I guess, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's both due to the places that I work, which tend to be a little bit more monochromatic. Um, and, uh, but it's also, you know, there's like a bit of personal taste to it too, which is that um, I tend to prefer the tones of nature and, and nature by and large doesn't really like things to stand out and be bright um, unless they're intentionally to be noticed. Most of nature doesn't really want to be noticed because <laughs> um, that means you're going to get eaten or, <laughs> or discovered or, you know, and so it's usually generally not a good idea. Even predators don't want to be noticed, right? So, uh, so nature is tend tends to be about blending in um, and being part of the natural community, <laughs> uh, whereas the human world is very much about pay attention to me, pay attention to me. So I think that that shows up in the way that I look at color too. <laughs> well, that's that's so interesting that you brought that up. You know, because uh, 
you're right. Like nature, nature in, in, in its own little way, it doesn't call attention to itself. Whereas everything in human, con uh, in, in, in the, well, not everything, but most things in the human condition are about, you know, pay attention to me, or, you know, I want to be part of this community. I want to, you know, like, and, and the way to do that is to say, oh, you know, um, look at me or look at what I'm useful for or whatever. Whereas with nature, it's kind of like, you know, everything has its own purpose and use, but, but it doesn't need to stand out because just by existing, it, 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 it already has validity or it already has, you know. Yeah, I go so far as to say that it's not a really necessarily human condition uh, 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 really at all. It's a particularly, um, it's particularly like a, a result of capitalism and a result of individualism, you know, uh, right. right? Like build, you, you go to uh, Thailand and there's billboards and flashing neon signs and stuff like that everywhere. That's capitalism, right? Uh, trying to catch your attention. Um, and people are wear bright clothes and all that kind of stuff um, as, because of individualism, right? right? If you go back far enough into any of our human cultures, you'll see that we tend to be pretty plain um, and things don't tend to stand out uh, that much. The color palette is, has a tendency just like nature to be pretty, um, uh, pretty cohesive. Um, and you, you, the only places where you see uh, things stand out are when you get um, status things. Um, mm -hmm. Kings and queens wearing um, particular colors that only they can right. have the dyes for, or whatever. Um, right. But it's not until the mo more recent, very recent times that you start to see everything human tend to be brightly colored <laughs> and and stand out as kind of a look at me thing because of the nature that gets killed. <laughs> well, there you go, and I mean, it's 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 interesting too. Like um, when you when, like, for example, when you look up into the sky and you and you know you see the stars and and like. The reason that they stand out is because of the space, like everything else is, you know, dark or black. And so it's like that contrast allows for the stars to shine. Um, <laughs> whereas, like in the daytime when the sun is there, you know, you're not seeing any other stars. You're just seeing the sun and it's like it's overpowering. Um, so like it's quite interesting to think about like how that translates into photography. Like let's say you're taking a nighttime photograph as opposed to a daytime photograph. Like the, there's like the color palette or the like whether it's uh you know whether it's bright or cool like all these things change depending on on the lighting and depending on the you know the, the place that you're shooting yes yeah yeah absolutely yeah, very true and you're also a filmmaker um yeah i am sort of an accident of filmmaker in some ways uh, uh i i do it um and um, I have some of the skill set for being for filmmaking, but um, I tend not to concentrate. But I'm really mostly a still photographer. Um, I'll, I'll do I'll make films because uh, I have extra time. Sometimes on a, on a project or assignment, and I can start shooting footage. Um, and if there's something really compelling, then I'll, I'll make a film of it. But generally speaking, I'm a still photographer. Uh, I prefer it's because of how non-intrusive it is. Mm. You know, like I can carry on about my regular business and be a normal human being some of the time uh, while I'm photographing on a on a project or assignment. Whereas when you're a filmmaker um, or you're, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, if you're a director, a little less so. But um, you know, if you're um, a camera person or director of photography or something like that, you're surrounded by other people who are also working on that same film. You're not really immersed in the thing um, that you're a part of nearly as much. It's hard to be immersive because you're, the, the film crew itself is taking up so much space, um, so much uh, attention. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, as a result, you're, and you're also changing the situation to a certain extent as a filmmaker. Yes. Film is also, it's much harder to capture things that are, that are unfolding through film. Um, the, the real events, um, a lot of times uh, things have to be repeated in order for them to be captured on film. And so you end up with filmmakers asking, do things again and again and that kind of stuff um, and uh, that's just not really the way that I like to work uh, <laughs> um, but which is not to say that um, I don't like making films but it's just a, it's just a different thing it's a different mentality um, yeah. and uh, yeah I just sort of plenty to occupy myself as a still photographer <laughs> well you know I um, well here's an interesting like thing that happened like I um, so I'm, I'm by no means like a, a, you know, a skilled photographer, but, but I enjoy it. You know, I enjoy taking photographs and one of the coolest photographs I've ever taken was staged, you know, where I, 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 
family friend who is a professional photographer. He had this like vintage camera and, and, and we, and so we both held his vintage cameras and were like, like dueling, like in a camera duel where we're taking a photo of each other. And then somebody took a photo of us doing that. So. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's terrific. Oh yeah. They, I mean, there's a, there's a wide, wide world in uh, uh, still photography as well. Like I come from a documentary tradition right now, but before I was, I was a commercial photographer um, right. and an advertising uh, photographer. So, you know, we do like crazy things like heavy composites, seven image composites of people doing things and, chopping different parts of the landscape up and putting them together, lighting things and removing things, you know, um, and it's all in the service of a particular goal. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, you know, there are plenty of conceptual artists who do uh, work like that, that is totally fine art as well. You see, but there's not really, um, I wouldn't say that there's, uh, there's not, uh, there's no rules really when it comes to art. Uh, it's, it's totally unnecessary. Um, I will, I will say that there is a, there is kind of a worrying trend that I don't love, which is the, um, the increasing use of, um, of a, very simple tools that allow you to do things like replace skies and uh, uh, like very quickly change um, huge portions of an, of an image just with a single button click. Um, and that's a little bit worrying in the sense that it's, so it's just continues to erode the public trust in um, in the veracity of images, and, uh, and that's difficult because the um, when someone like an advertising photographer, a conceptual artist, does it, it's fine, and we understand. You know, we know because it's written um, that they declare that the work that they made is fantastical, <laughs> yes. um, and that's the problem. But when you start, when your regular everyday person starts to take their iPhone photographs and um, alter them in such a way where they and they're passed off as real, um, which they will be unless you declare otherwise, you know, so they're passed off as real um, as, uh, as a document of a moment in time uh, with a bit of truth, then um, it continues to erode the public trust in what is valid and what's not. Yes. Um, and that's really unfortunate. I think uh, the other thing about it too, that it affects photographers, which I think is um, um, the thing that we don't talk about very, very much, which is that photographers themselves, um, you won't, you get to be a much better photographer when you try to get it right with just the camera as opposed to trying to fix things and trying to make them better through um, photoshop or through, through, right. through uh, post-processing um, and so th this is the unfortunate thing is that a lot of people get really hung up on using photoshop to make their photographs better when in fact um, you might not make that particular image better um, but that's not the point you become a much better photographer over time if you don't rely on those tools and you just simply try to seek out and try to make better photographs with the camera. Yes. Um, and I think that the, the argument that you can make art, et cetera, is totally valid. But um, I think that many, many people, like a huge percentage of the people who are using those tools are actually what they're trying to do is trying to make um, something that they captured uh, better without having to put extra work into it. Um, right. And that's important. That's not, that's not where we really want, that's not really what we want those tools to be used for. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. And it's kind of like, yeah, like in, you know, in clothing where they say, you know, um, measure twice, cut once, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm sure like, uh, I'm sure like, uh, you know, like post-production must play some role in the photographs you take. I mean, like, um, or, or, or is it completely not part of your process? Like you just take the photo and that's it. Like it doesn't, it's completely raw. It's completely unedited. No, I mean, they go through Lightroom and, and uh, very occasionally uh, through Photoshop if there's something that needs to be done. Um, like, uh, you know, there's some kind of dust that needs to be spotted out or uh, I mean, there, there's a, some, some kind of image that's really fantastic because of what's happening but the contrast in the place that the subject is disappearing to the background or something like that, where I need to go in and get some fine tuning in Photoshop to uh, bring it out. Uh, but, you know, uh, by and large, I pretty much treat it as um, whatever I've shot in the camera to be, I want that to be, uh, that is pretty much what I'm counting on is the photograph, you know, so anything I do into it in Lightroom is extremely minimal. Right. You know, I mean, we, we have a lot of, uh, very specific photojournalistic standards also that we have to adhere to as um, in documentary. So, um, you know, can't add or remove objects. Um, you can't obscure anything. Um, 
and um, you know you can't like blatantly change the color of something. Um, so there's actually quite a wide latitude of things that you can do for photograph, but I, we can't really do things like change the sky, <laughs> you know, or um, or um, remove something that was going on in the background because that really does change the scene. Um, yeah, and it's very fascinating because you. There are historical photographs that are that were taken um, centuries ago, uh, where people have been able to figure out information about um, a particular a particular thing that happened because the photograph remained unaltered. You know, and because there is like information embedded in that photograph that's incredibly that isn't um, necessarily aesthetically uh, desirable, but it gives a little bit of information that helps us figure out what was going on in a historical setting. And so there's right. And it's a bummer when all that goes away, you know? Uh, so yeah, post-processing wise, I, I don't do a whole lot of stuff. Um, the mo probably the most drastic thing that, that I really do to photographs is I use dehazing quite a bit. Um, uh, and dehazing is something that, especially like in time you see an underwater photograph, I'll almost guarantee that it's got, it's been dehazed. The contrast has been increased because that's just how underwater photographs are. They, uh, by and large, um, lose a lot of contrast and so, um, Dehazing is something that we use liberally, even as geographic, um, for aerial images and for underwater images, and, that, and that's just something that we would have done in the dark room back in the day uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, and you know, uh, do you do you work with film? Like, do you do you do you shoot onto onto film at all, or or is everything sort of directly onto an SD card, or like, or you know? No, it's I, I'm all digital. I'm all digital. Uh, yeah, I've considered um, moving into film and doing some film stuff here and there, but uh, I mean, to, to be honest, I don't really have the uh, time for it. Hmm. You know, um, I, I, honestly, I mean, it's, it, there, there's just so many like extra considerations that I have to have um, already, even working with digital equipment, that it becomes really difficult to add the complexity of having to work with film, you know, working, right. you know, work in cold places and um, yes. all that kind of stuff. And so, I mean, do you do you consider yourself? Uh, I mean, obviously, you're a documentary photographer. You know, you're 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 doing things that are trying to capture a certain like reality. You know, as 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 you experience it. Um, but do you also sort of see yourself as a conceptual artist, or like, or as a, you know, or I guess no, I shouldn't even make that division between being a documentary photographer or a conceptual artist because I would say they they. I mean, you know, obviously, like there are concepts that that inform your being a documentary photographer, but but I mean, do you relate? What I'm asking is, do you relate with the idea of being a conceptual photographer? Yeah, I do. I mean, because uh, the work that I do is highly conceptually driven. You know, we're 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 driving a story through the notion of understanding what the story is. Yeah. You know, I'm not just attracted to what looks nice um, or what fools me. Um, I'm, uh, I have to go in service of the story, and so uh, by nature, by its very nature, it is conceptual. <laughs> there's, no, there's no doubt about it. Um, I, you know, like, uh, and I, you know, when I was a commercial photographer, I did a lot of stuff that was much more um, sort of straight conceptual in the sense that, like, you have just an idea and then figure out some aesthetic ways to accomplish that idea. Yeah. Uh, and there's any kind, you know, I wouldn't have gotten there if I hadn't had the concept. Uh, so. Yeah, you'd say that, but it, but you know, I would say that uh, in documentary, having concepts is incre are incredibly important, very very important. Definitely. For sure. Um, and so, like with your public speaking engagements, and like, and you know, when you're talking about the experiences that you've had, um, like, obviously, you know, um, you use your own photographs and like you use your own sort of footage as you know like to, to show like the things that you're talking about. Um, so like, do you, like, is, is it important to you to, you know, to use your own footage or to use your own photographs or are you also open to like, um, you know, using other people's photographs or other people's, um, you know, uh, work in your, in your, you know, when you're doing a lecture or like a public speaking engagement? Yeah, sometimes I will. Sometimes I'll pull, um, if I'm doing public speaking, sometimes I'll pull another uh, images from other places to just to be able to describe the story a little bit better. Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to things like maps, I will pull in maps uh, to be able to show, um, give people a sense of where things are. Um, but you know, it's rare. It's rare. I don't do it uh, very much at all. 
generally in any given presentation, I use just this little slideshow of all, all my images um, and then maybe a map uh, and that's it. I, I don't think, uh, I do think that, that, you know, it's important to be able to support, um, if there are holes in the story, there are things that, that you didn't get to talk about, you know, to complete, talking about things that complete things, it's better to be able to use something than not talk about it at all. Yeah. Um, but there is also, you know, a lot of issues around copyright and, um, you know, like in order to take someone else's work and use it, right? So you, you want to be really careful and you avoid doing that unless um, you really need to um, for some particular reason. Like they put a lot of work into making that happen. So <laughs> uh, you know, if I'm speaking publicly and gaining something from it, then it should be using someone else's work to do that. Yeah, that makes sense. That Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, and then, you know, like the idea that, you know, when you take a photograph of someone, you know, is that photograph then yours? Do you own it or like, or is the ownership shared between the person that you took the photograph of and of course you? Well, I think about it as two, two different things um, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, so from, you know, from the, from the um, US point of view, I am the copyright holder. So I will protect that copyright. <laughs> um, and um, I consider that to be, you know, the copyright is something that I hold because I made the work and had to pay the expenses for the gear and all the things mm -hmm. to make that happen, you know. So that copyright is what is able to feed me so I can keep doing the work, the future work. Um, but the, the, even though the photo copyright is um, that way, I, I do think about that there's a different framework to understand it under, which is uh, that um, stories themselves are collaborative um, with human cultures. You know, I tend to think of them as being uh, collaborative and, um, you know, there, there's different types of stories, some where you go in and you're not necessarily collaborating on a particular story, but you are, um, you know, like uh, collaboratively crafting uh, a narrative, but you're trying your best to just empathize and understand what's going on. Um, and then there's other stories where you're actively collaborating, um, helping um, a place to understand a sense of itself. Uh, and actively being a part of it, you know, and that's that's a really different thing because then it rides the line between uh, it, it, It's not that it doesn't it's not documentary. It is documentary, but it's participatory And that's a sort of newer more experimental thing where you've inserted yourself and been a part of it But you tell people what you've done, right? So you 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 actively change that kind of scenario and it's the, um, I think that's all those different kinds of things are important, different ways of looking at documentary are important because it gives you, um, it's, it changes uh, the power dynamic because most of, uh, many of the times when a journalist in the past have gone to a place that is, uh, that basically uh, is less powerful, as you could say, is less influenced in the world, um, I'd say the vast majority of places that are not American, other American culture um, are going to be like that. Then when you're telling a story, you are um, imposing not only your own viewpoint, but you're also kind of, because of the power dynamic, you're taking their story and using it for your own purposes and people themselves aren't really getting anything out of it. You know, especially from this sort of vague notion, sometimes journalists will be like, oh, you get something out of the story which raises awareness about them. Yeah, but maybe, but what, what's the awareness? <laughs> what's the awareness? The awareness is um, like a heavily biased version of what people think you are and not what you actually think you are. That's not, um, then no one's gaining uh, anything by that except you. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's very important to be able to um, know that, you're, that your bias exists, to be able to tell a story as empathetically as possible. But then also to, to know when there's sometimes the power dynamic is such that people have never been able to tell their own stories and um, the most important thing to do is to find a, find a collaborative way to tell that story yeah uh, to figure it out you know sometimes there's some there have been some really radical projects out there where the community itself will make a film about its own self mm -hmm. um, and uh, some like the uh, community for Zacharias Kunick who's uh, an you know, filmmaker um, up in the Canadian far north, their entire community has now become like a filmmaking production studio. Um, and they tell stories from within their community um, and also um, fictional stories as well that tell about their values and morals and things like that. And it's really incredible. So that becomes, the, that's, the, that's sort of like one extreme 
um, which is to counter the other extreme, which is a foreigner coming in, not knowing anything about what's going on and telling the story from their point of view, right? So we need all of that. We need yeah. all of the different levels of collaboration um, and all of that. In terms of ownership of a story, I would say that you should really think about it as ownership. Mm. You know, it is a, a story is a living thing, uh, yes. has an agency and it comes from a certain place and you have to source and talk about where that story comes from and recognize where its biases are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in a lot of cases, I would say that you don't really, um, you, you don't own that story. Uh, and, you know, you can think of, it's best to think of all of these things as collaborative pieces because the community doesn't own the story either. Um, they, because it, and they don't necessarily wouldn't want to own it because the you, it's your interpretation. It's an artist's interpretation of what's going on. Um, it, only when you get involved with the community itself and then the two of you crafted something together, that's when you could say that both of you own it, <laughs> uh, yeah. right? Uh, but otherwise it's, um, it's some level of, of collaborative endeavor. Uh, which is fine, you know, and we need, and we need all of it. Um, I wanted to ask you a personal question, which is what does, what does your name mean? And like, um, do you, do you know what, what it means? Yeah, well, well, Al-Kili is actually a, a most common name in the uh, for, for men. Uh, and it's also a clan name. So we have 13 clans and uh, it's a clan name. So it's possible to name Kili Kili. <laughs> um, uh, but it's not, not, that's not that. That's not, uh, that's not super common. Uh, and so that's what my first name is. And my last name is Chinese. So it's Ria, which means uh, fish. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, it's, it's actually my, 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 both my parents' last names smashed together. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but my, my dad's uh, last name is means fish. So if you have been to Chinese speakers, they're wondering, Ria doesn't, Ria doesn't mean fish, or Ria means fish. <laughs> That's really cool. So, um, so you know, I guess you're you're a living embodiment of pluralism, and and we were talking about like being a third culture kid, you know. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a, so so it's a you know it's one of those things you just really I, mean, I hated it growing up. It's just like no, it, it's it's so hard to be different from everybody else and mm. called out for being so different, um, uh, especially growing up uh, and the be called out for being different without even really understanding why you're different, you know, as a young kid. Um, but then over time, just as you grow older, you find, you figure out that being different gives you certain advantages and you can figure yes. out how to make those things work for you. Yeah. Um, that's fantastic. Um, and I think that it does, in, if you don't run away from it all the time, then you realize that it gives you a different way of seeing the world and that that can be incredibly valuable. Uh, so, but it's all. But you have to be really smart to leverage that <laughs> to, to to use that in the right way. You know, and to be proud of it. Yeah, yeah. Because like I think like owning it or claiming it, although those are those are also like loaded words. But like 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 I guess living it or embracing it, like you know that that's really important. Because like you know then you know then it's like you you know you have some you have some sort of. Um, control maybe or like some some sort of say like in the narrative of who you are like you're you know you're able to you're able to say this is who i am and and like not let other people define you or let other people yes that's you. right it's a little bit like uh when you know uh when you see achieve some level of notoriety then people will write a wikipedia page about you you know <laughs> and, uh, you know if you're if you're smart enough you will go into that Wikipedia page and you will make some edits and so that uh, people know who you think you are rather than everyone else determining who you are for you, you know? And uh, that, that's, uh, that's a kind of a nice way to look at it. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's hilarious because like anybody can edit Wikipedia. So, I mean, you know, like you'll find some very bizarre things, you know, where it's like, you're just like, how did that happen? You know, it's like, well, anybody could edit it. So that's, that's what happens, you know? When right, it's, totally. It's like, instead instead of it being a personal narrative, it suddenly is like a, a collective narrative or even like even a public narrative. Cause there's all the different, you know, there's all the different levels, right? There's the public narrative. There's the, you know, all the different masks that we wear, you know, the, I, I think you know about that that concept where you know there's all the different masks that we have and then and then there's that 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 final mask which is the one that we take off and we 
some people can't take it off, but that mask where you take it off and suddenly you're looking at yourself in your, you know, in like you're seeing the essence of who you are or whatever. And like, yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting concept also, because I think it's really, uh, it's a very particularly Western idea that you be consistent uh, yeah. among uh, between uh, different situations. Uh, you know, uh, the majority of the world's cultures, once again, actually don't really think it's weird if you don't change your situation, change um, how you behave around different types of people, different people, right? Like, and that uh, makes total sense to me. Both of those sort of make sense because I understand both, you know, but you know, you can think about it this way. Um, most of people watching this are, are probably Westerners uh, is uh, like, you don't really want to act the same around your way. Why would you act the same way around your elders or your parents as you would around uh, your homies? <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it would be, uh, you know, you naturally don't do that. And, and so why, does, why is it strange that you would be asked to, to be consistent? You know, um, the, the notion that, um, you know, you as an individual have this consistent set of uh, traits that determines who you are on the inside is very um, it's a really interesting thing and it it reflects a very particular concentration on the individual you know um, as this uh, almost like as if you were born and you were set in stone and that's how you are <laughs> well yeah and then there's this idea like you 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 know you might not swear in front of your elders or you might not do certain things in front of your elders or your parents, yeah right you know right mm -hmm. Sure. Ah, it's only natural. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, listen, it's been uh, a real pleasure to have this conversation with you and, and uh, thank you for agreeing to do this. You know, um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I've definitely learned a lot, you know, about, uh, about your perspective and also, um, you know, also your, your practice. Cause like, um, you know, obviously it's one thing to look at a photograph and say, oh, wow, this is beautiful. It's a whole nother thing to learn all the things that go into it or the process of making it or the person that's taking the photograph. So thank you for, for giving me that perspective. Or oh, sure. You? You're very welcome, Ross. It's very, very nice to talk to you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Likewise. Okay, so I'll let you know once it's uploaded. I'll send you the link. All right. Cheers. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. <laughs>